Good morning, church. It's a privilege with you uh, being able to share this incredible story of the Hebrew people coming out uh, of Israel, um, of the of the Egypt, out of slavery, and now they're in the desert going towards the promised land. And we heard some great storytelling uh, from Joe and he, all these incredible readings. And uh, it very much it has really, really lifted uh, my spirits and this incredible journey to go through. I love storytelling. I love these great and powerful stories. And today is very much that, but today is more of a warning because the story that we read today about Exodus is a warning from the past. Because as I was reading through the word and I was trying to prepare this story, I actually found out that there are two events, not just one. In Exodus 17, we read of the first event of when Moses drew water by striking the rock. And this was in the second month of the first year. So literally at the beginning of the Israelites being in the desert, recently just being a few months ago, being in captivity, this event happened in the first year. But there's a second event we find in Numbers 20, in the book of Numbers 20, chapter 20, that actually Moses again has to draw water from the rock. But this actually happens near the end. So if you look at the map that I've prepared for you, you see that there's a desert of sin, which tells you a bit about what we're going to talk about today. The desert of sin is actually the first event. If you find it south to the Mount of Mount Sinai, south of the desert, south of Egypt, there in Ephraim, that is where you actually find the first event. But the second event is actually further north, near the, in, in Kadesh, it says, is the land of Kadesh, and it's actually the desert of Zin, with a, with a Z, not with an, N, not with an S. So it's a different place. And many scholars believe that this event happened in the first month of the last year of, the, of them being in the wilderness, so literally just as they were about to go into the Promised Land. Now, interestingly, today's talk, as I mentioned to you, is a warning from the desert. Today, we are being warned. And we're going to see that even Paul himself in the New Testament actually mentions this as a warning. But I pray that as through these warnings, because we're going to split this warning in general into a few mini warnings that make into one big warning, we're going to see how we can take from it something that is going to be of great benefit to our faith, a great benefit to a walk of a Christian life. And I hope it's an encouragement to you as an encouragement to me. Let's read quickly chapter 20 in Numbers, because I want to you read. We've read the first part in Exodus. Let's read now the second part that says, verse 1, In the first month of the final year, of the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh there, Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead the, to the, before the Lord. First we'll stop guys. This is where we need to notice the difference. The similarity here to the original event nearly 40 years ago is that they were quarreling. Okay. Number one quarreling and we're going to see that this quarreling was deep rooted in their hearts but interestingly remember here in numbers is near the end Miriam has just died and been buried Miriam was Moses's sister and she had actually just died and she was buried there in Kadesh near where they drew water from the rock this is the fulfillment because remember at the beginning God had already said that the majority that were over a certain age, apart from Caleb and Joshua and the younger generation, were going to die in the desert. Miriam, here in verse 1, is an example of that, reminding us that the leaders themselves were also promised to die and they weren't going to see. But we're going to see a bit more as to why. Why did they not go into the promised land? But straight away, we see the similarity from the first to the second. The quarreling was there. So the children, this younger generation, were also quarreling. We're also uh, uh, gossiping. We're also angry. We're also showing these signs of not being happy, of stubbornness. In verse 3, it goes on, they quarreled and then Moses said to them, and they said to Moses, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. So they're saying, in other words, if only we had also died with our ancestors, with our, with our older generation who died at the, over the time in the desert. Why did you bring the Lord's community into the desert? Why did we and our livestock should die here? It's repeating. It's the same sin. Exactly the same sin. There hasn't been a change of heart. If you remember, I mentioned to you my story last week about how my family moved here to the UK. 
We had moved, but we were still in the desert. We were free from slavery, perhaps in a metaphorical sense. The Israelites were free from slavery, but they're very much full of sin, full of anger. We're going to see a bit more about what, what this means to us. And he says, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain, no figs, no grapevines, or pomegranates. There is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went through the assembly to the entrance of the tent of the meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Now notice here, you might think, you might think that actually Moses is doing the right thing here. Like he did a year ago. But notice that they did not say nothing to the people this time. They just stayed quiet. And it seems in verse 6 they went directly to the Lord. And you might think, oh, they did the right thing. But if you go back to Exodus, on verse second verse of Exodus 17, Moses replied to the people when they quarreled with him. Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? So notice that in Exodus, Moses is straight away is referencing God. He's putting God first. He's saying to them, why are you putting to the test your Lord? Why are you putting our great Lord who saved you? So straight away, he's honoring God by putting him first in the problem. Do you notice the difference? But here in chapter 20 in, in Numbers, in this second event, at the end of the 40 years, Moses didn't say anything. He didn't put the Lord first to the people. He just went quiet with Aaron. In verse 7, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Key, key verse now. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it would pour out its water. Speak to the rock. Do you notice the difference now with Exodus 17? In Exodus 17, God said to Moses, walk on ahead of the people, go with your staff and stand before the rock and strike the rock in verse 6 in chapter 17 in Exodus. Okay, so chapter 17, verse 6 in Exodus, God tells Moses, strike the rock, strike it. Here in Numbers 20, in verse 6, he says, speak. There's a great, great theological difference between the two. And we're going to see later on how this is going to help us a lot in understanding about where their hearts were and what God is trying to show us today. So Moses, being told to speak to it, uh, stands up with on verse 9. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as God had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Wow. And here comes the big problem, the dilemma we're going to finish off later on. Moses is putting himself equal to God. Or at least he is saying 50-50. Is that what we learn from the Bible? Is that what we learned from the gospel? That it was 50-50? Jesus was crucified on the cross, but we were somehow also uh, receiving merit because of it? That's not what the gospel says. The gospel says that because we all sinned and because we were separating from God, we needed Christ's redemptive work, redemption through the cross. We needed Christ's atonement because we couldn't do it. But Moses is saying here, must we, so who brought the cloud? Who brought the fire in the night? Who brought the angel of death? Who brought all the plagues? Who brought? Who opened up the Red Sea? Who brought down the manna? Moses? The staff that was made out of wood? We can go out right now and cut a tree. Although for climate change, I'm not trying to encourage you to do that, but you can go now and grab any tree, any piece of wood, and God can use that. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees in the New Testament? God can bring out Abraham, servants of Abraham, out of the rocks. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. God can use a rock to bring out any servant of Abraham. So it wasn't the staff that Moses used. It wasn't Moses himself. Because Moses was just a man, a human being, just like you and me. It was God who done the miracle. It is God who saved. It is God who called his people. It is God who's going to reveal them to the truth. It is God 
himself who loves us because for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Moses committed a great sin here, putting himself subtly, perhaps subconsciously, letting his anger take control and it brought the pride. Must we bring you up water? This great man Moses, unfortunately, shows that he is also a human being and he was also susceptible to committing sin, just like we all are. It doesn't matter. Moses raised his arm, and this is the second sin now. Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff, and the, wash, the water gushed out, and the community and the livestock drank. Moses did not speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock twice in anger. First, he made himself equal to God, and secondly, he disobeyed God's order in anger. But notice that God is merciful. Because we're going to see now that God's justice has always gone hand in hand with his mercy. Why? Because in verse 12 it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you do not trust me enough to honour me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the, to the land I have given them. These were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarrelled with the Lord and where he showed himself holy among them. You see, Moses and Aaron fulfill the promise that they were not going to go into the promised land. God's justice was being shown. Now you might say, why was God so harsh when Moses wrote the five books of the Torah? He wrote the very books that we're reading from traditionally. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these events. But as you can see, there is no bias here. Moses himself shows that God shows no bias to anyone. We need to show a truly repentative heart true repention, true desire to go against our sins and turn from our old life to a new life. But Moses, it seems that this quarreling, this anger that the people showed had now seeped into the hearts of Aaron and the leaders, and they also were going to die in the desert. And that's where we see God's justice. But you might say, but why, what is this justice? Why, why is it so harsh? But look at the mercy. What happened when Moses struck the water? Even though he was had to speak to it, the water, it says in verse 9 and in verse 11, sorry, the water gushed out and the community still drank. So water is still flowed. God is still showing mercy, even though we do not deserve it. Water is still flowed. I remember watching a movie. I love movies. I'm a bit of a movie buff. I love watching movies. And I remember in this movie, in the Star Wars this famous scene where the young uh, Jedi, the young Padawan, um, was going to meet his master Jedi, who was one of these great masters, one of these great leaders. And this young uh, Padawan, Anakin Skywalker, he seemed to have fear in his heart. And there's a great line in the movie where the leader, where the Jedi master says to him, you've got to be careful with fear because fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. And this, this seems to be great wisdom. This is only a movie, but there seems to be great wisdom there. And actually it is biblical in a sense, because fear, not the fear of the Lord, but fear in general breeds in itself lack of faith. And that also breeds in itself a very, very bad attitude. And as you can see, with the, quarrel, the quarreling, the anger that the people had towards Moses and God was even from the first year, even from the beginning, and it carried all across the desert. It brought them to hate and self-loathing. It really is a lot of self-loathing. There was a great hate and anger. That's why all of them, they might, all of them of the older generation ended up dying in the desert. Why? Because in the end, this self-loathing brought suffering. And suffering brought death to their lives. And this is what we see in Psalm 37, 4. We see King David bring us a little more. Not just that, um, as we learned from the movie, that fear leads to anger and anger to hate and hate to suffering. Look what the Bible says. Look what the Holy Spirit inspired David to write in Psalm 37, 8 and 9. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. 
How apt is these verses to what was happening to Moses and the people? They wanted to inherit that land, but they let anger turn to wrath and wrath led them to do evil things. And even though Moses was a great man on the Lord, he was not a special case because God is just. And God is also just with those who are in leadership and who are responsible. God is just. God demands more from those who are responsible for the lives of many others. If I tell my son not to touch something because he might be burnt and he does it anyway, my son will suffer because he did not listen to what I said. But if I don't tell my son and I don't warn my son about the potential dangers of touching something that might hurt him, not only does he suffer, but I suffer in the eyes of the Lord because I am responsible for his safety. Moses was responsible for the safety of his people. And instead of saying, why do you test the Lord like he did in the first year? Instead of saying, God is the one who is going to bring us out. God is the one who's bringing the water. Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it and took his place where he shouldn't have taken it next to God. And that is why Moses turned to wrath and it led to evil because he did not show how God was holy in front of his people. And that was his sin. Now, I said to you, it was a warning, and I hope that we will look into the mirror because I definitely see myself many times turning to anger and wrath in my life. It's easy to say. Sometimes it's easy to go through the Bible and look at the Ten Commandments and say, oh, I don't suffer from that. But anger, anger, quarreling, lack of faith is a problem that affects everyone. It affects every Christian and it affects every human being. I remember learning in London Underground, where I work, that of Japanese knotweed, and we are taught to look out for it because when Japanese knotweed actually goes in deep into the concrete, it actually breaks up concrete. And that is what anger, anger and lack of faith are sins that do that to the human being. They go deep into the heart and it's extremely difficult to take out. And you see the older generation and the younger generation suffered from it. But if we go quickly to Corinthians, we see now that God always shows his mercy because the water came out. And this is what Paul chooses to learn, not just from the lesson from, from uh, Moses' anger, but also the good thing. What can we learn from this as Christians? Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 6. A warnings from Israel history. What did I say to you talk was? Today's talk was a warning from the history. Let's learn from what Paul is saying. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Jesus is the rock. Do you remember when Jesus appeared to the disciples and to the woman? In when we read about, uh, when you read in the New Testament, when Jesus resurrected and he says that he was walking with them, telling them, about the Old Testament and what the things that is said about him in the Old Testament. I bet you this story of the water from the rock was Jesus telling his disciples, this is where I was. You see, I was the rock and I was the water. You see, in John chapter 4, if we go to John chapter 4, what does Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? Jesus says in chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, Verse 13 to 14, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I'll give him will become him a spring of water welling up of eternal life. You see, Jesus is the rock and Jesus is the water. People in the desert had the rock, the symbol of Jesus right there, and they had the water to quench the thirst right there. But they were lacking in faith because they did not see God's work. They did not see that they were so close to the promised land. 
Remember, teens, the older generation died because they had a lack of faith that brought a bad attitude, that brought evil things and brought anger. But even the younger generation in, in Numbers 20, they were not seeing that they were so close to conquering. So my encouragement is to the teens, if you have never experienced God's word, get ready to conquer. Get ready to conquer your life. Get ready to make life-changing decisions that will bring a great blessing to your future. Go to the rock, go to the water that brings eternal life, that is Jesus. And to the older generation, to the leaders, and to myself, I feel as God is speaking to me, telling me, remember all the miracles and great things that God has done for you. Do not forget them because the people were quick to forget all the great miracles that God did, the manna in the desert, the splitting of the water in the in the sea, even the water in the first year, they forgot that God had already done it before. So my encouragement to us today is, remember the rock, come to it and your thirst will be quenched forever. My final words to you are today of encouragement church in Romans, because remember, what did God ask Moses to do? He told Moses to speak to the rock in numbers. The first time he hit the rock, he smite the rock, God said. You see, Jesus was crucified once. The rock was hit once. Jesus was crucified once. We don't need to crucify Jesus again. The second time, God said to Moses, speak to the rock. You look what it says in Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So my final word of encouragement, church, is that you remember, we remember, Jesus died on the cross already. We we don't need to hit the rock again in anger like Jesus did. We need to come to Jesus because he already died on the cross. The rock has already been hit once and he has already given his blood for us and his redemptive work shows two things you can only answer two ways to jesus's work on the cross it becomes a stumbling block for you and forever you will be separated from god or you let it change your heart and speak the words and believe in your heart and you will see this water that goes out like a spring an ever-ending spring in your life and you will see the promised land And I promise you that you will not just see the promised land, you will walk into the promised land, just like Joshua and Caleb. Let us pray, church. Lord, I thank you uh, for this great warning in the desert, O Lord, because sometimes in life we don't learn only from the good examples like Moses did in the Exodus in in the first year when he drew out the water. But also we learn sometimes from the difficult moments, O Lord. We have to learn from the mistakes that other people have done, O Lord, other servants of the Lord did, so that we can also learn from our mistakes, O Lord, and we can come to you and know that even if we make mistakes, you will still pour out the water, Lord, because you are such a merciful God. So I pray, O Lord, that if we are quarreling, I pray for water, O Lord. I believe if there's a lack of faith and a bad attitude in our hearts and our home, I pray that you pour out your water, O Lord. I pray, O Lord, for a life-changing The way we see, that we no longer see with our eyes, but we see with our hearts, we see with our faith. And we can walk into that promised land or that eternal life that you offer us, O Lord. Not only after we die, but now, now to be able to change our lives, O Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.